Good evening and welcome to the May 9th Select Board meeting uh, in advance of uh, town meeting at 7 o'clock. It is official time here. Calling the meeting order at 603. So we'll start as usual with opening remarks, announcement, and agenda review. Is there anything on the agenda that anyone needs to either mention, amend, or otherwise, or any announcements anyone needs to make? And if not, I think we'll head right into our agenda. And so first up is um, under our action and discussion items, our public art mission. We have both the utility art project and a draft policy on the public <coughs> Um, so if you want to share with us about that. Uh, thank you. I'm going to ask Amy Crawley, who's uh, heading up the utility box project, to introduce that and herself. I'm Amy Crawley, member of the Public Art Commission. In January, the Public Art Commission received a local cultural council grant for a project titled Enlivening Public Spaces. This project is designed to further the presence of public art in downtown Amherst and the Amherst Center Cultural District by inviting local artists to create unique and colorful paintings on three designated utility boxes on North Pleasant Street. This will be achieved through a public call for artists and subsequent jury process. The jury will include two public art commission members, one or two abutters to the utility boxes, and one or two local artists. Following a series of press releases about the project, the painting of the utility boxes will take place in mid-September, and the public will be invited to watch the artists paint their creations. Prior to painting the boxes, the three winning artists will be responsible for cleaning and preparing the utility boxes following DPW guidelines. Now, precedence for the painting of utility boxes exists in Amherst as seen in the Emily Dickinson utility box located at the corner of Main Street and Dickinson near Hope and Feathers Framing. Additionally, painted utility boxes enhance the downtown landscape and can be effective in decreasing the incidence of graffiti. The, the three town-owned utility boxes that we have chosen are located in front of Subway, one near St. Bridget's Church, and one in front of Ruger's Bagels. Now, currently, one of the boxes tagged with assorted graffiti and one has been used to display flyers and announcements that must be frequently removed. So imagine instead three colorful designs on these boxes. This project is designed to encourage community engagement, to contribute to the vitality and attractiveness of our streetscape, and to further enhance the Amherst Center Cultural District. Similar projects have also been successfully completed in Northampton, Greenfield's Downtown Crossroads Cultural District, and the Springfield, Springfield Central Cultural District. And if in the future the appearance of the artist's creation deteriorates due to weather or other damage, the town of Amherst has the right to paint over the design without notification to the artist. Uh, the Public Art Commission has met with and received support of this project from the DPW and the Designer Review Board. And we're happy to answer any questions if you have any. Did you want to add anything to what she No. Okay. Mr. Wall? I just had one, since I haven't been able to attend your recent meetings, one question. Mm -hmm. I, I gather from the description these will be permanent and not rotating designs. In other words, you wouldn't have a set of designs and then a new contest of new designs. Not for those three, unless there was you know, extensive damage, we could mm -hmm. run another call for artists and have them redone. Mm -hmm. um, or alternatively, in the future, expand to other boxes in town. Yeah, I was just wondering because I mean, you've got it, obviously a wide range of possible topics, and I was thinking, for example, that 2019 is the centennial of the Jones Library, mm -hmm. and they're playing various things to promote the culture of the book, the history of writing in Amherst, <coughs> uh, window displays, and so forth. There's also going to be a major uh, international conference of scholars of the book, history and art of the book, coming to UMass in summer of 2019. So oh, okay. I'm sure they'd be del delaying to see things of that sort if that's at all possible. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my question, and forgive me if you mentioned it, and I just mm -hmm. didn't get it, is, um, is there remuneration to the artist who's chosen, or are the materials paid for? 
Uh, the Public Works Commission, how does the money part work if there is no money? So the grant that we've received will allow us to have a stipend of $350 for the winning artist. And they will receive that uh, once they submit an invoice to the commission. And then we will, the, the grant is given after the fact. Mm -hmm. So then we would submit uh, the invoice to get the money and then reimburse the, the artist. If I could just follow up on that one piece. Um, mm -hmm. But they would pay for all the materials. We're How hoping to get something, some items donated um, or through a, a gift certificate and then other items. And just on that thing that for the money, and do they get to sign their name? I mean, is there sort of a marketing benefit to that artist or is it just the 350 and it's anonymous? I would say they are going to be announced in publication. Um, through Gazette or, or online. Um, there is precedent for the artist to put their name on the box itself um, and then in pictures that they take of that um, can of course go onto their, their website or, or their portfolio. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I have a question uh, actually from Mr. Rockleman. Um, are these boxes in the public way and will it require separate action from the select board if they are in the public way to authorize this use? They are in the public way, so it would require action from the select board. So we have a separate meeting, we'll need a motion or make one tonight? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to follow up on that question because the other one that occurred to me is who actually owns these boxes? Mm -hmm. Are they owned by the utility company or are they owned by the town? Uh, and if they're owned by the utility company, have we reached out to them to get an okay from them? From the DPW, there are town-owned uh, boxes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, Mr. Steinberg's question. So if it comes back for at the actual approval of the painting of, like so many things, does that mean we see a, a, a picture of what will go on there? I mean, I don't want to be like the the art review group, but would we actually be approving a specific image or would we just be approving the use? Well, I don't know how, I mean, there is one already, um, mm -hmm. the Dickinson, I'm not sure how We don't know how it got there. Yeah, nobody knows. <laughs> the dark of night. <laughs> uh, it's, I think it's beautiful, but um, I, I think that you would say, yes, you can do it and you delegate to the Public Art Commission to make the decision. Give them the so authority to make that business, yeah. honestly. Give, give them the authority in that, mo whatever, the motion. Sure. So a, a couple of follow-up questions along those same lines. One is that it's simply that we could have had that motion on our motion sheet tonight, and we don't, because I was wondering why we were looking at this at all in terms of our agenda, given that we don't have a motion mm -hmm. to do the public way. And so I feel like we are adequately prepared for somebody to make up such a motion so that it doesn't have to come back, because we are not the arbiters of uh, what art will be yes. done on there. Um, but so that issue aside, so thank you for trying to address that. Another is um, actually two other questions. One is associated with the specific businesses that they were near were mentioned. If I can hear a little bit more about any reaction those businesses have had to this. And then also my third question was <coughs> relating back to the information in the application summary and what was just stated in terms of stipend of 350 plus materials. So the intention, I believe, was that um, and as was indicated on the timeline and was said, is that the materials would be donated, but if they weren't adequately donated, that somehow those would still be paid for out of the grant in addition to the 350, just to clarify mm -hmm. those issues. Mm -hmm. as, in, as opposed to you get what you get from the, <laughs> the um, donations, you, perhaps there would be additional things that would be needed. So I'm a little unclear on that. Um, the abutters were waiting until we pres I presented to the select board okay. to move forward and um, alerting them that, that we were going to move forward with this project. And um, to your question about the the stipend, should as you said, we not receive 
uh, adequate donations, then the artist would be responsible for purchasing extra materials and those receipts come to us for as part of their invoice. So they would be awarded. And that three hundred and fifty dollars would cover that. So if I could follow up then, thank you, that's very clear. And so since I understand the process that you undertook in terms of not talking to the abutters to mm -hmm. we said it was a crazy idea even though we've already gotten the grant, so it would be too bad if we decided it was a crazy <laughs> idea. So there are chicken egg questions here, but beyond that, um, given that we don't have that reaction, then maybe that would be a reason not to make up the motion tonight in terms of uh, future, in terms of public work. I mean, I appreciate that concern, but the abutters don't have a say in this. I mean, if there are DPW boxes, the town does what it does. It informs the abutters as if to require to receive some input. I mean, I'm not sure what the abutters are going to say about that. Mr. Sander? Yeah, I, I mean, I did think about this in regards to, for example, St. Bridget's Church, which is one of the locations, and uh, if there was uh, choice of art for that box that seemed in any way disturbing to um, leadership at the church, that we would hope that that would be um, considered, mm -hmm. at least. And, um, but I think it's a, it's a difficult question because it has to do with the actual choice of the art, much as the choice to paint artwork mm -hmm. on the box. Um, we are also extend going, you know, we're extending to the abutters the opportunity to be part of the jury mm -hmm. as well. I mean, last I checked, it's still a public place ruled by secular law, and I would assume that the people we appoint to the commissions use good judgment, so it's nice to be concerned about these things, but I think we can also get concerned about things that are not really likely eventualities. Other questions? This is going to be really brief because we're going to drag this out. But the abutter issue. Um, so one is in front of St. Bridget's on North Pleasant, and the other one. So at where the Subway restaurant is? Uh huh. Right there on that corner. Oh. Okay. Um, St. Bridget's, it's right where the light okay. is at that intersection. Mm -hmm. And in front of Bruger's. Okay. So with the abutters, when you say the abutters, you said there are two slots for abutters on the committee. Mm -hmm. There's three locations, and one might guess some of those locations. There's, you know, the next door store or whatever. So mm -hmm. you'll know, you'll talk to all of them, but only there's only there's two slots on the selection committee for mm -hmm. abutters. I was <laughs> crafting a motion and I will read what I wrote and then if uh, Mr. Bachelman uh, suggests that we hold offering the motion um, until he has a chance to consult others uh, that I'm not going to make it actually as a motion but it would be along the lines of motion to authorize the painting of public art on three utility boxes on North Pleasant Street, one each near to Subway Restaurant, St. Bridges Church, and Bruger's Bagels, with the approval of design by the Public Art Commission. Uh, Are you waiting for a well, reading? Yeah, okay. Second. Okay, then I will make that as a motion. And, the and I will give that to us. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. aye. Opposed? So that's unanimous. I will give it to you okay. at the end. Okay. Good. Good. All right. So the other topic you guys were here about is uh, <coughs> policy um, regarding public art installations by private developers. Okay. 
I'm Eric Brody. I'm chair of the Public Art Commission. And this is an idea that we have been uh, developing for some time, <coughs> even before Percent for Art was passed. Uh, members of the commission, namely myself and Renee Tiberge, were talking to the archipelago developers about art at their projects that they've been developing in town. And while they were receptive, um, th nothing you know, concrete came of those discussions. Uh, I think largely because we didn't have any leverage then because the town wasn't doing anything about public art in its own buildings. But since the uh, passage of the bylaw for <coughs> percent for art by 71% in town, it became clear that now the town will be putting <coughs> uh, public art in its major uh, construction projects and renovation capital improvement projects. And we're in a better position, I think, now to approach developers because uh, you know, we're basically putting our money, own money where our mouth is on this subject. So the, the idea is uh, different communities <coughs> have dealt with private developers in different ways. Some communities mandate through a percent for our program that private developers participate in that program as well. We felt that would not be appropriate for Amherst to do it at this point, that it would be onerous. Uh, there's not enough uh, commercial development that we would want to put that at risk. But we did feel that we should encourage develop private developers to uh, consider and include where at all possible um, some kind of public art in their own projects. Now, they, we've got Two that Archipelago has already um, erected, and they're planning a third on Spring Street, and we're hoping that uh, um, we can talk to them with a little more uh, authority about including art in, uh, in some of them. Now, I've learned from Chris, uh, Chris Bestro that when they made their proposals to these projects, they did uh, in include public art as part of the projects, uh, which haven't yet appeared, including on the one on uh, on the corner um, next to Bertucci's at Triangle Street, there was in their brochure a lovely sculpture of a statue that they had uh, just photocopied from an Oregon artist and put there for promotional purposes, and they said they intended to do something like that. Uh, now, that might have been on the public way, so uh, the policy itself here deals with um, art that could be on totally private property, but also art that is on the public way, because they uh, should be treated differently, or would be treated differently, as the town have, would have more of an uh, investment than anything on the public way. So we decided to take the approach of trying to encourage developers, um, particularly if the town is offering any kind of uh, incentives for them, uh, or they're getting incentives from the town, I should say, uh, to put up their buildings in return. Uh, we think it only fair and reasonable to ask them uh, for something in return, uh, specifically public art. Uh, it's clear now that the town uh, is interested in this, is supportive of it. So um, we talked about what, how, how should this be formalized and we took it to the planning board first and not knowing whether it should be uh, a policy from the select board or you know this is sort of new territory for all of us um, but through the discussions of the planning board and later with the design re review board it seemed like a policy from the select board seemed to be the most appropriate way to deal with the question uh, which is why um, we're here this evening uh, and hoping that you agree. But if there are, if there are other ways that this should be handled, um, you know, we are, of course, open to anything that works for the town. Um, the planning board uh, was interested in it. They had very minor changes to this document. Design Review Board had a couple of tweaks they wanted to make. All those have been incorporated into the proposed uh, policy that you have before you. So um, we're here to talk about uh, if this makes sense for Amherst and if, if this is the way to handle it. Um, we are anxious to get your views on it and uh, happy to answer any questions.
you may have. Questions? I'm okay. sure somebody's got well, some. Well, looks like Mr. Steinberg and that other people. Well. I mean, I just sort of have a question that we just point out that we do need to consider whether um, it's consistent with Charter Section 10.7b um, for us to take any action on it before the new council oh. is seated. And that's a determination that we will need to make. So I think that any further conversation we have probably needs to be with that thrown out there is something that we will have to consider before we did anything other than to state our thoughts. So thank you for saying that, because one of us was going to say that first. Come on. <laughs> and the other part was uh, that I'm wondering about is if this doesn't pass and action needs to be taken and we are proceeding on building a building prior to any such policy existing, whether select board or town council, because if we put it off and based on the charter uh, transition provisions and town council isn't able to take it up right away, but we do eventually get into the process of building a building, I guess I'm looking for the town manager's opinion on what happens given the bylaw that, of course, hasn't actually gotten through the special <coughs> legislation yet, but assuming it eventually does, um, how how these things will be dealt with if this doesn't exist. Will you just consider this advisory or, or what will you do? So I, I think this applies to private developers, so it's different than the, the mm -hmm. bylaw that was mm -hmm. passed by town meeting. And so I think this would be advisory to, to private developers. Um, I, mean, I think that in terms of, since the bylaw hasn't been acted on or the um, the special legislation hasn't been acted on by the legislature yet for the public art piece. Um, you know, that uh, there's there are no projects in, in waiting to happen or putting the you know to get started. And there's not there's no funding to start any at this moment in time. There won't be until the council the town council takes office. I think there's timing isn't an issue. Um, this is something for private developers, and I, mean, I think. Public Art Commission and others can advocate when they go to their, through the permitting process to say, we'd like you to incorporate public art. You're doing a major building in the town center of town. Um, we think you should incorporate this as part of your, and if they say they're willing to do it, get it written into their their permit so they can guarantee the building. So that, to my point, and Mr. Buckman just expressed that I think someone showing it in a rendering and you're assuming it's part of a project, but it's not literally that piece of art, it should be written into the, as a condition of the permit, uh, the yeah. permit granting authority. But mm -hmm. the part where I am having a problem okay. is where it says, if as part of that discussion the town offers concessions, for example, in the way of requested modifications or waivers in order to obtain uh, artwork that otherwise would not be included. So I have trouble trading waivers for art. Um, we have a specific bylaw that does uh, change some density calculations when there's an inclusion of affordable housing. It's codified in the zoning bylaw. But the reason we um, have requirements is because they're good requirements. If we could just waive them when we got something we wanted, why would we have that requirement in the first place? So it makes it sound like the modifications or the waivers or something that wasn't important to the building, but, and we'll trade that for art, because art, you know, is clearly important to us. Well, there's, I've seen things where it's trade your zoning requirements for energy conservation. I mean, there's a whole list of different worthy causes that have been suggested in other communities or here as an offset to some of the zoning requirements. But um, I wouldn't want that reworded where a conversation with a private developer in a discretionary permit where they're saying these are some of the public benefits including this piece of public art could mean something but to trade a part of the zoning requirement for the art which maybe isn't what you meant but it's kind of implied here that's mm -hmm. more hung up Mr. Wolf. I, I'm not sure I may know where that came from because I chaired the working group that did the natural and cultural resources section of the master plan and so if you look at um, NC2G, <laughs> it says provide incentive to building owners to increase space for locally produced public art and performances, and it talks about 
public acknowledgement, density bonuses, opening our extensions. This is, of course, just our consultants going nuts uh, in a wish list, fantasy world of everything in the kitchen sink. So there is, it is written there, mm -hmm. and I oh, think those were meant to stimulate yeah. thought, but I think, as Ms. Kruger points out, it might be difficult to achieve in practice. But the, the principle of encouraging public art by private developers and providing incentives is mentioned there. The idea of a revolving fund probably makes more sense if we could accumulate money that could be distributed as an, you know, as an incentive to the developers. And just a footnote, um, I, I agree with the point about the rendering of a building with a piece of art not being a guarantee. Um, if I recall from the hearings of the planning board, the Spring Street project was going to include some kind of art either art on the grounds and sculpture or gallery space down below. There was some vague talk of taking art from Amherst College and displaying it in this downstairs area. So that's one possibility there. And then as far as the uh, one East Pleasant, of course, the developers are, you know, there's a mural there that was created by the town uh, and funded by private donations. And the developers are paying the artist fairly nicely to reproduce that mural. And they talked also about doing something in the way of public art or wayfinding to direct people from the street back to the cemetery because it's hidden behind the gas stations and the shops and so forth. So those are at least two things that they have in mind. But I agree, obviously, an agreement or some kind of an incentive is better than just uh, vague wishes. So I'm finding some difficulty just in following this document in general, and so maybe somebody can help me out in a couple of areas. One is where it says, it is the policy of the town of it, this is under private development projects heading. It's a policy of the town of Amherst to encourage private developers to include significant art. I, I don't think that is written anywhere unless it's in our mm -hmm. public percent for no, art. No, so this is the written, policy. If this is yes, the exactly. policy that says that, but but I'm uncomfortable with inserting that in there as kind of a third point as opposed to an actual. I'm not. I don't know why it's listed there. I'm just finding the whole thing very difficult to follow. And obviously, planning board, design review board didn't have the same problem, but I am having. It. On the reverse, it says project art on public property. I'm not understanding how we get from point A to point B. So we ask private developers to put art on their property, and then they decide they want to put it on public property, but there's in a public way. Then there's a whole other set of issues that <coughs> aren't that I'm having trouble understanding where our decision making like about three simple electrical uh, utility boxes is versus some giant sculpture that's getting put on the public way associated with private development and where there's this long list of things that are happening in five points here but I'm having a hard time understanding where the equivalent of the select board comes into that conversation with the public way and so I, I'm just not really grasping as to how we're getting from point A to point B. So if one of my colleagues, knowing how my brain works better than the Public Art Commission oh, does, wants to try to explain this to me from the standpoint of the public way, um, I mean, I can read the words that are in front of me, but I'm, I'm not grasping how we get from one point to another. Can I just make one comment on that? That's, that's in there because um, uh, the archipelago team informed us that that proposed sculpture that was in the brochure would have been on the public way uh, if they had in fact erected it. So it, it could happen in other, I, I don't know what projects would be coming down the line with future developers, but it's conceivable that there would be something that would be on the public way that was part of the project or that could be part of the project. And all this tries to do is address that contingency if there were public art that were proposed to be on the public way, like that sculpture outside of that first building. Um, this provides protocol uh, on how to deal with it. How, sh how should the town deal with it? Should it have any say at all? And uh, our, our view is that yes, since it's on the public way, uh, the town should have more of a say in what that art is and how it's handled. And uh, maintained. My sense is, I mean, I'm sympathetic to this, but my sense is we're not really ready to take any action on this, especially you know, the abbreviated meeting schedule we have before mm -hmm. the uh, town meeting. So I think we might need to come back to this, study it further, and discuss it further. If that's true. And, and, and I, but 
I'm not sure it's going to help because <laughs> they're, I, I'm missing the part where someone is, where a private developer is compelled to provide public art at all. And so if they're compelled to do so and they can't do it on their property, then the filing purpose, I don't understand why they would ever be compelled to do so because they're a private developer. So who would compel them to do so? I think maybe it back, gets back to Ms. Kruger's point about, you know, sort of uh, in that earlier paragraph on the front side where it, it, the town is offering concessions and this is a stipulation of, of those, you know, as part of what goes along with those things. So if we allow a certain waiver, you know, sort of the piece that they can offer to compensate for that would be a piece of art as opposed to something else. Um, I think that's sort of how we get there, but I'm not sure it's articulated as cleanly as it needs to be for that purpose to sort of tie those together. I mean, it obviously we want the language broad so it can be functional and allow for you know, discretion and interpretation, but at the same time it, it may not be quite fit together quite as tightly as it needs to to make that functional, I guess. Yeah, the policy saying. doesn't compel at all. Mm -hmm. yeah, it, it addresses what happens, for example, if out of the goodness of their heart, right. they want to put a piece of sculpture mm -hmm. on the public way. Um, how do we handle that? There is no policy or protocol for that right now. So we are just trying to get ahead of the curve here in case that happened. And I'm reminded, I'm sure you know what happened when uh, an artist volunteered a gift to Northampton's Pulaski Park and they didn't have a gift policy to receive it. They ended up rejecting it uh, because they didn't have a protocol to deal with public art. It's actually, in my mind, a beautiful sculpture, but they weren't prepared. So that's something we don't have either. And that's next on our list also to consider. What happens if that happens here? Someone volunteers you know, a, you know, a significant piece of public art. How do we deal with that? We don't have a policy about that, and we should. And we'll probably be drafting that as well. Uh, if this is the forum, the select board, or uh, I can't speak for what the city council would be, but uh, currently uh, the forum for this kind of a document or policy to uh, exist in or be a function of it. Cool. Sort of uh, thinking back about the transition question Mr. Steinberg raised and Mr. Buckman's answer. So if this is guidance or uh, uh, suggestion to a, a private developer, that's one thing. But if it's policy to, the, to a governing body <coughs> of how to handle that with a private firm, it seems that we, we are venturing into the transition zone in, in a way that would say, hey, you know, City Council Select Board on May 9th, 2018, created this policy, so that's the one you're going to follow until you change it. But along those same lines, I'm not, although I was working through the idea mm -hmm. of this just being the principles by which the Public Art Commission works and says, these are the kinds of things we'll take with us when we go to the hearings. This mm -hmm. is the kind of right. thing we're looking at the last one. And we will advocate back to what yeah. Mr. Buckman said. We will advocate for these things because as a public art commission, these are the things we develop based on our expertise, based on the experiences of other communities. Mm -hmm. However, to say that it's even our policy or even their policy, I think is the same transition problem because it's not just the select board that isn't supposed to be doing new things. It's everybody that's not supposed to be doing new things. But guidelines, I feel a little you know, more easy about. These are our ideas that we've worked hard to come to a common consensus around, as opposed to we've created a new policy in these particular circumstances. So I think, Mr. Brody, one of the things he suggested was, what if something happens, someone comes in with a significant piece of art they'd like to donate to the town? What's our process, maybe not policy, what's our process? I think that's a totally legitimate thing to lay out. Like mm -hmm. uh, today, here's our problem because we have to think that through. We want to do that in advance. If someone's saying you know, we'd like to put a piece of art on Kendrick Park or someplace mm -hmm. else, what is our process for that? And we, it's probably wise to lay that out. Who would be involved in the decision? How the decision get made? We might not be able to. Meet, decision may not be able to be made depending on the scale of things. But um, but at least everybody would be on board with where, what's that. 
path of life. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that um, it was easy to um, come to the conclusion we did about the painting of boxes that are already there, but constructing something new, placing something new in the public way, and then using space, possibly impeding traffic, uh, foot traffic or vehicular traffic, a whole bunch of issues that would have to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it's sort of difficult to deal with that in advance, and um, I'm also um, cognizant of the analogy to the proposal of the Business Improvement District to put a bandstand on the common, mm -hmm. and um, that has not been an easy process either because it involves both the use of space on the common, both enhancing and affecting possibly negatively the use of the common. We don't know, but we see the design. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's um, just a difficult issue. It's not one that I feel comfortable with um, fly making a policy statement on. And then I'm kind of left with back to the transition provision in addition. So I will suggest the following. I think we're happy to offer lots of commentary on this, <laughs> as you've already experienced. But I think as far as formally adopting it as policy, or I think even maybe even as guidelines, because it's a significantly new thing. That's not to say we don't need them. I think that's, you know, your point is well taken. That in absence of policy, then we're, if someone offers a piece of artwork, whether it be building construction or just an artist wanting to offer a piece of art to the town, we're going to be stopped because we won't have something. But in, you know, I think that um, I think it's difficult for us to take formal action on on this anytime in the next several months. But at the same time, it doesn't mean we shouldn't work through some of this to sort of prepare it for the council because I think that'll be more appropriate for them to adopt policy on it. But I think you know there are practical things you know around public way and that sort of experience we have that we can offer as a suggestion and opinion for, which we already have to some extent, but yeah, I think we can continue to comment on, but as far as adopting formally, I don't think, uh, that's what I'm hearing from my colleagues, and I also hold that opinion as well. Um, but nonetheless, I think there's there's still positive action that can be taken in regard to sort of continue to refine this and prepare it, and then have it ready for when the council you know, takes office. I mean, we're sort of meddling in your business now, but does it make sense for the Public Arts Commission to have a document that says, you know, our, we want to encourage um, public art on private property or privately donated to public, and we will work with you, and here's some guidance and what we're looking for, and if you do these things and we like it, maybe we'll go to the Permit Granting Authority hand in hand with you and advocate for your project. I mean, you have a little bit of leverage to provide some guidance just at the level of the program Commission. And that, I don't think, treads on the more formal public way approvals. Just an idea. Okay, I, well, I, I see that the issues that you're raising. I mean, the, I mean, the hope was that to have something <coughs> to hand the developers when they approach the town, in case you hadn't noticed, Amherst is interested in public art. If your intention is to include public art, Here's how it would be handled if it was on private property or, or on any of it was mm -hmm. on the public way. So that it was part of the package or whatever Amherst gives to developers. Mm -hmm. So the, the other, what you're saying, suggesting is just being a resource. Uh, of course, we could. For now. Yeah, for now, do our best to do that. And, uh, and we do that already. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of those, with the transition provisions of the charter group. Mm -hmm. A little bit handcuffed in some ways, right. and you know it, it does impede action that would likely be considered non-controversial in a lot of ways. But we can't presume that, and so I think yeah. we have to be. A I do understand that. I, mean, I understand that that's in the uh, charter, but it would be helpful if you think that um, this document needs has issues and problems that would that need to be addressed. Uh, regardless, it would be helpful to know what they were so that, as you say, we could be prepared 
to make a better presentation to the new council when it, when it does uh, mm -hmm. materialize. Um, We're not going to write you anything that tells you that. We just told you that. <laughs> yeah. And so that's, that's not something we have the time or bandwidth to sit <coughs> and analyze and write a memo about. So I think if you watch the tape again and just think about the spirit of the things that we talked about, I think that you will accomplish what you're talking about doing. And of course, as we've said, informally, you can already have these conversations with developers, and it is this awkward space where we're not going to write a memo explaining all the different things we'd like you to change about this, because we're just not. I just to add, um, Mr. Ray, I'm always continuing to be impressed with how committed you are to public art, so I, I don't think this is like a bad thing just because we threw a bunch of criticisms at it. I think it's getting a conversation going, and I, I think you are, have the best intentions for public art and you've, you've worked tirelessly for many years and you've come to us with bunches of things. So I just want to appreciate oh, your you. commitment to this. And it, it wasn't a, a bad thing to bring to us. It's just we're struggling and it's the first time we've had a chance to discuss. And so right. I want to encourage you to keep working on whatever version is appropriate for these times. And I really care about this stuff a lot and appreciate that. I think additionally, you individually, we can offer a suggestion to them is if we find time, if we have, <laughs> we have you know, I, I'm yeah. not sure there's going to be a lot of that, but well, if, if, if something, if, you know, but if a it's light bulb goes off at three in exactly. the morning, you know, send you an email, I, I promise I think that I will. Can be advantageous. So if there's something, you know, a month from now that, right. that yeah. one of us thinks of or some, yeah. you know, piece that would be beneficial yeah. to you, then, um, you know, we're, we're uh, likely to offer that to you as See something so. in planning magazine about public art and its right. relevance. Right. right. So I think that that, that may be the case. And so I would I would also say to my colleagues, if you do think of something, you can free to yeah. share right. with right. with the public art commission because I think that'll just help. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, help yeah. refine it and keep it moving forward in a way. Right. Well we will be drafting uh, as we did with this, it would be important, as Northampton has found, to have a gift policy in place too, or mm -hmm. or a protocol mm -hmm. of some kind, yeah. procedures, so that we're not embarrassed by having to turn down a substantial gift because we don't know how to handle it. Mm -hmm. So we'll be working on that for the new council as well. Yeah. And I don't think we'd necessarily be opposed to seeing that and offering you <laughs> critique as well, but, <laughs> you know, you can come and get abused anytime you want. Always happy to appear. Thank right. you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So next on our agenda, so um, we're, you know, we're going to take positions on April 30th in the Taiwanese articles. Um, I'm not sure there are any that we need to take any action on this evening or review that I know of that we're prepared to, Mr. Simon. I just want to point out that we have heard um, rumor that somebody may make a motion to reopen one of the enterprise fund budgets for the purpose of amending the budget. And uh, so I'm going to assume, as the speaker on budget items, that this is equivalent to others. And that since the budget was passed as we recommended it, we uh, do not pay the reconsideration. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Just recommend, recommend against. Mm -hmm. um, you want to take a motion? Or? No, that's not a motion, that's just a statement. That's just a statement. Yeah. Somebody <coughs> wanted to go otherwise. I don't want to interrupt that promise, but similarly, rumors that there will be an amendment to the uh, possible amendment to the capital budget around. Um, so I don't know how far we want to start talking about that. Um, assuming since we approved the capital budget that we would um, not approve an amendment. I think so. I think you know, we could speculate all evening about Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I think, especially on budget, I think we're pretty clear. We right. supported this budget, and so to accept any amendment would be not supporting our own actions. Right. I mean, unless there was some emergency you know, lava flow we had to spend money, I know, that I can't. Right. Okay. Do we have a 48-hour notice? I, uh, 
I think there was something that we had. The license? Well, we have a license, so uh -huh. why don't we do that? So someone would like to make the motion on the on the one license we have. Let me take care of that. We'll do the mm -hmm. topic to time. approve the application of Tapa, the campus incorporated for a special license to serve wine and malt beverages at the Conti Building Atrium on May 15, 2018, from 5 p.m. to 7:30 p.m. Kimberly McAllister, board member. Second. So a motion is second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. So that's unanimous. And so topics not anticipated in the last few hours. Yes, uh, so a petitioner brought in a number of signatures, not the requisite number for a, requesting a special town meeting for one uh, <coughs> article to address campaign finance reform. Uh, there aren't enough articles to require it. The question is the charter gives you guidance in terms of what you can call a special town meeting for. I, I just want to alert you to that effect. Um, and town Council will be rendering a uh, written opinion as to provide some guidance because this might not be the only special mm -hmm. town meeting request you get. You will get others. Wouldn't surprise me. And so having some, using this as an example with, with a hard request and having town council, town attorney put that into context for you would provide you some guidance. So a follow up, I really appreciate that. Um, because we had been warned by the petitioner that this might happen at some point. But to follow up on the very first part of what you said, I had been given the impression from the email that they simply hadn't certified enough signatures yet. Are we saying that, in fact, they didn't even submit enough signatures right. to force attendance? It's 200. Right, it's 200. Mm -hmm. Certified. And they just didn't. Mm -hmm. right. Was there an explanation yeah. for that? As to, like, like, we didn't get enough, or we thought you'd call it anyway, or? I mean, that's what I don't understand, yeah. because yeah. it's a hundred, yeah. like if we'd already right. called one, they only would have had to get a hundred. Right. But to force one and put the item on, I mean, to force one for their own thing, they needed 200, assuming we were even a town anymore, mm -hmm. that um, <coughs> is bound by that master. I don't know if they have an explanation for why these are But, but, but they, they didn't offer it, it to you, right. is what, <laughs> that, so that's what I was looking for. Okay. And just to so be clear, two weeks ago, I had a, when this, for my first heard this, I did yeah. communicate with the petitioner yeah. saying, this could be a concern in terms of whether there's a legitimate option available uh, for this select board. Thank you. So what, oh, I'm sorry. Good. Um, what I, I was expecting the petition would come in with a certified number of signatures and then I still had a, a legal question about that. Mm -hmm. But given that it, it, it doesn't even meet that threshold, it would be, you know, we can only figure out what's implied, because there wasn't a cover or a statement, that if we wanted to act on it, we could, or we could also have a motion just saying we declined to act on a calling special, in, in, you know, just decline to act on it. So I was just trying to get it out yeah. to you as and soon as possible, because right. you're meeting, you're seeing right. the same people who are signing it, and I know. And I didn't want you to be caught off guard, that it was act oh. active. Oh, no, so that was good. Normally, we would wait until we had the requisite number of certified registered mm -hmm. voters mm -hmm. signed, which we don't, and then that would be presented to you. Right. But and, oh, if okay, so, brought in one so declining might be premature. We still don't know, uh, and maybe this will be in the written guidance, <coughs> if the requisite number of signatures, certified signatures, were to turned in under the rules that we're under now, would we have to hold a special, or can we say no? If, if assuming that there were the two hundred, right? So, so it doesn't even get to your agenda right. until, until there's a requisite oh, okay. number of signatures. Right. So okay. If they get the requisite number then of we'll signatures, that triggers something. Okay. And it, it triggers that, that they have the ability under state law to ask you to hold a special town meeting, and you have to weigh that in terms of the charter, which is mm -hmm. also state law, um, passed by the legislature, passed by right. under under right. the Home Rule Act. And you, in, in, in that, the transition provisions gives the select board the decision they need to make this. Mm -hmm. and, and what I think the town council will tell you is that you, you know, these are both state laws. There is a, this is a more, the charter is a more specific law and that would trump the general oh, state okay. law. And so we would get that kind of And you would have to make that call. You would decide, right. is this something that is um, not a, 
so we need to delay. So it's kind of an FYI, so we know yep. because it just came in within the 48 hour, and we can know about it. But we're not ready to act. Right. But more to unfold, mm -hmm. and we don't have a message. We don't know if it's, if it's a, if we don't know if it's real yet because we don't have the requisite number of signatures, mm -hmm. and then you don't have to be, if it does become real, then you would say, well, what does what are our options here? Right? Okay, we don't have to do that now. In, ter in terms of our options in that memo, could, I, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this because it is a slightly different situation, but it is something I've been saying a lot ever since we started working on marijuana, I suppose, is how do people sue us for something like this? And so if we make the determination, and I'm not being, no, no, I mean, I know it sounds a little no, funny, just, but, and we get to use it all the time, and that's sorry, fine, sorry but for laughing. Is, this is such an unusual situation with the transition period. And so if people are unhappy, if we make a decision either way, either to accept it, and then people who say, oh my goodness, you shouldn't have done that because you mm -hmm. have a charter. Mm -hmm. And the people who say, oh yes, you should have been, with separate. like, who gets to say, is that just, I want town council to come back and say, select board has this authority mm -hmm. to make this decision and kaput, that's the final place that people can do it unless they come up with some super creative way of suing us that nobody's thought of before. Like, there's not an obvious path. Like, land court is an obvious path for certain <coughs> things. Maybe. Well, is there a thing? Can sue you at any moment. Yeah. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But there's no obvious, like, no. like land court is an obvious path for certain kinds of things. I mean, you don't file anything in land court, you file certain kinds of things right. in land court. Mm -hmm. So this there's no sports. obvious court, there's no obvious court of appeal, yes, is what I'm is. saying for this, beyond because, us. Well, We're no, in. there is. If we take an administrative action and we follow our procedures. You cannot people take sue. people's right away. Oh, you can't remove the ability to go to the courts. I don't know which court. No, but that's not what I'm asking okay. to do. I'm asking it to be clarified if there is a known court of appeals for this sort of decision, or if it's just the generic ether, people will find a way to go to the courts. But I don't believe there's a, a known court of appeals for this sort of thing, per se, like land court is for certain right. land decisions. So why are we discussing it? If you're relying on the charter, which is right. what we would do, there is no appeal process right. 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 outlined in the charter. So they would, then they would appeal Someplace. <laughs> Superior court or whatever right. court. That's, what, I, court. that's what I'm making sure we had not missed something right. on that. There, there is no obvious Their court. lawyer would tell them in okay. court. Thank you. So can we make a couple of date announcements before we get out of here? Absolutely. Well, there's a couple of things I want to mention. Okay, why don't you do yours first and I'll see. Well, mine's going to be, say. if it's dates <laughs> announcing when things are happening, do it now. All right. So, so go so right ahead. When things are happening. So. Um, Race Amity Day is coming up on Sunday, June 10th, which is a week after the Human Rights Heroes Awards. That's at Mill River. Um, Race Amity Day is at UU. We're going to be asked to read the proclamation. Mr. Slaughter, if he's available, we'll be doing that. And I've asked staff to follow up because honestly, I couldn't remember if we've already done the proclamation for this year, but I kind of thought not. Um, but it, we're following up on town meetings action associated with that. And the other one was associated with the item on our desk tonight. Since marijuana is such a new issue for us in Amherst, even though we've been working on it in a long time, to <coughs> announce that the entire community is invited to the grand opening event for what has previously <coughs> been known as GTI and will now be known as RISE on Meadow Street. And that they should attend that on May 16th from noon to 3 p.m open house with ribbon cutting at one o'clock. Obviously, we will not be serving customers at that point, but they will be doing tours and giving discussion about what their plans are, and they're planning to start serving patients a week later on the 21st. So I thought that was good, that it's not just a little small thing that they're doing, but they're saying the entire community can come because this will be our first one. So well, speaking of dates, so in our packet tonight, this a calendar that looks like this with lots of colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. However, there are a couple of changes that I want to alert you to. Um, not on the what I would say the front side, which starts with January of 2018, but on the back side, um, um, the, it would be in. Oh, it came tonight. Attached to that letter at the back of the letter. Mm -hmm. Right. So just before this. Yeah. Yeah. Not in my copy. That's okay, I can get an invitation. <laughs> We're going to give you new ones anyway, but I want right. to point out to people that in July, instead of the 2nd, it's highlighted in, in yellow, it should be the 9th. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, in October, and uh, we had picked the 1st, the 15th, and the 29th as meeting dates. 
but the 22nd, if the first is not appropriate given the holiday that's there. So we were going to research that, i.e., ask Mr. Wall. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think those were the only two edits. Yes. Okay, so those two edits. Um, so we'll, but along with that is just look those dates over. And I know um, this couple has reached out to us for our summer plans. I'm personally still figuring those out, but we will need to to do that. And so we'll probably, if it's known that some of these dates are really awful, make sure to let me know, and then we can. We usually have a motion at our next meeting where we sort of set these dates and then we'll modify them as we learn more. But just want to put that calendar out there for folks so that they can look it over. Mr. Walter. Well, see, it says Columbus Day here. What's that? It says Columbus Day on the 8th. That's right. It, says, it should say Indigenous Peoples Day. If it's a town holiday, it's Indigenous Peoples Day. That's right. I'm, I'm confused by what we have in our packet, so somehow things happen. I didn't get that one fine. I'll get it later. But we have one dated May 2017 to September 2017. That was Are just for reference. Of just to show us what we did last, last, last summer. summer. Right. So mm -hmm. last that's summer really the as, a, as a reference. Mm -hmm. Right. And so are we going to have a packet delivery this Friday for Monday's packet, since we don't have a bunch of stuff here for Monday's? Don't really answer that. Meeting. And so if we are, then it would be great to have that reprinted with that mm -hmm. date correction, yeah. that nice colorful mm -hmm. one. And if we aren't, well, then maybe somebody could bring an extra copy on Monday. Great. Yes. So I think at this point, unless there's something anyone else needs to mention, we'll uh, we'll go into recess for the evening. Okay. And uh, we'll turn later, but we'll go to recess and we'll get ourselves into the meeting. Okay. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. We're talking about two for you.